Um, and thanks for uh, still hanging on after this very packed day. So what I want to do today is indeed talk about green extractivism and um, violent conflict. And regularly we see in the media headlines popping up of green extractivist projects such as wind farms um, or uh, mining operations that are being attacked by armed actors. And we also read regularly about protests against green extractivist projects that turn violent. Um, and this is a common recurrence um, in, in the media and, and takes place actually all over the world, both in the global north and in the global south. And um, the expanding green extractivist frontier is um, actually creating, in some cases, uh, new situations of armed conflict or feeding into existing ones also provoking and intensifying uh, violent resistance and state violence. Um, and uh, as we've seen today, um, creating also new and intensifying geopolitical tensions that may feed into violence. And there's of course a mutual relationship uh, between violent conflict and green extractivism um, shaping one another. And uh, we've seen some, some great examples uh, of how this occurs throughout the day. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, Western Sahara, where uh, new tensions are emerging because of uh, so-called renewable energy uh, projects being enrolled there. Um, but there's also other examples of, for instance, um, the geopolitical stakes. If you look at AFRICOM, um, the US Africa Command, which has expanded its operations in Africa, but is very clear about um, particular forms of competition with China being a driver of this process, if we go by their own discourses um, at the display here. Now, I'm talking about violent conflict, but what am I actually talking about? So this morning, Zender unpacked the green extractivist part of the title of this conference, I want to delve a little bit more into the violent conflict aspect. Of course, multiple forms of violence are inherent to conventional and green extractivism, and we've had numerous examples of that uh, throughout the day. There's, of course, direct physical violence, but there's also a whole host of other violences. Um, most of these conceptualizations draw inspiration from Johann Galtung's original uh, um, um, conceptualization of structural and cultural violence. Um, but we also see many forms that draw inspiration from Spivak's epistemic violence or actually Bourdieu symbolic violence, um, Nixon's slow violence, and a whole range of, of violences that have been um, conceptualized in recent years in the political ecology literature so, and, and anthropology as well, such as infrastructural violence, sustainable violence, and, and green violence. And all these forms interrelate in very complex ways. Um, what I want to do here today is uh, I do focus on situations of uh, direct that also involve direct physical violence, because as we will see, these are always entangled with this, with this range of other violences. And I'm also not going to talk about the geopolitical aspect today, but more focus on sort of intrastate um, dynamics. Now, what is then actually violent conflict? I mean, it's commonly defined as a situation where at least two parties are trying to resolve competing claims or interests to the use of physical force. But this notion of physical force tends to be approached very differently uh, when it comes to state and non-state actors. So we often see that um, state violence is being downplayed or is not being called out for what it is. Uh, whereas um, when it concerns non-state actors, we often see labels like terrorism, uh, extremism, etc., being thrown around or claims that um, these actors or movements are uh, uh, using physical violence, whereas that might be uh, also debatable. And we do see differences in these framings as well in global north and global south context. 
So we just have to be very careful uh, and aware. And here I want to refer to the work of Peter Gelderloos, especially uh, his 2005 book, How Nonviolence Protects the State, that drawing boundaries between what is violent and what is nonviolent is in, in inherently a political and contested act. Uh, and this is all the more so once we start tossing the label legitimate violence in there. Um, there will be endless contestations around. So we have to be quite careful when using these terms. Um, so how then does green extractivism link to violent conflict? Um, there are different or actually overlapping mechanisms that have been identified in the literature on uh, the links between resource extraction and both the onset and the prolongation of uh, violent conflict. And um, as most political ecologists know, um, a lot of this thinking developed in the early 1990s in response to the so-called environmental security thinking that evolved in the 1980s and that started using notions like resource scarcity um, in order to explain how contestations uh, and other uh, around natural resources and other socio-ecological transformations could lead to violent conflict. And um, political ecologists have done a great job in unpacking many of those uh, rather problematic assumptions, including the very notion of resource wars, um, because that presupposes a sort of um, monocausal um, dimension of like these, these wars being essentially about uh, uh, natural resources. So I'm drawing on some of these uh, uh, ongoing debates, um, as well as on some terminology of the contentious politics literature in particular, because the contentious politics literature developed by uh, Taro and Tilly um, actually sees armed and social mobilization as part of a sort of continuum or spectrum. And, and I therefore think it's useful to, to use some of their uh, terminology. Now, there's three broad uh, mechanisms that I want to discuss today. The first is the grievance or conflict mechanism. The second one is militarization and other forms of state and corporate violence. And also the, the third one is changing resource endowments. So um, as we've seen uh, in most um, papers that were presented today, um, the like, Enrolling green extractivist projects, whether it is uh, uh, mining, whether it relates to nature conservation or agriculture, um, it tends to profoundly change relations of property, authority, identity, and notions of citizenship and um, access to and control over natural resources. So there's profound socioeconomic and social ecological transformations in the areas where these processes unfold. Uh, also through infrastructural development, migration, displacement, and ecological destruction. This creates, as has been extensively theorized also in the literature on resource frontiers, this creates new dynamics of inclusion and exclusion, legitimation and delegitimation, de and can spark new conflict over access to new economic opportunities, um, unequal distribution of revenues, but also the unequal distributions of the environmental burdens um, of these projects. Now, what is an interesting question is how do these conflicts and grievances then lead to violence? We can never assume that conflict automatically leads to violence. Um, and this is uh, also hotly debated in relation to the, to, to the uh, climate conflict nexus. How do um, social and environmental transformations induced by climate change um, contribute to violent conflict? There's no direct causal chains. This is very complex, multidimensional processes, and we have to carefully um, actually analyze these per individual context. So it's also quite difficult to, to draw uh, um, firm generalizations. Nevertheless, we do see certain recurring patterns. Um, and as many of the papers also highlighted today, what often increases the risk that um, 
conflict term violence is when these new grievances and conflicts related to green extractivist projects are grafted onto and start interacting with other and transforming actually other existing conflicts. This happens on um, occupied and internally colonized territories. We've seen the example of the Western Sahara and the Syrian um, Golan Heights today. Um, existing other ecological distribution conflicts, secession conflicts, in, uh, class conflicts, and uh, also identity-based conflicts, as also the paper by, uh, by David King pointed out, these multiple lines of conflict um, that are um, at work in many contexts and that start intersecting with these conflicts around um, green extractivist projects. Also, we've seen abundantly today many projects take place within historical context of um, inter internal or external colonialism and exploitation and are therefore read through frames that are shaped by these histories. Um, and beyond the sort of material dimension, I think it's quite important uh, to be aware of the sort of new, well, in the contentious uh, politics literature are framed collective action frames. Um, that can spring up um, in these contestations around green extractivist projects and that help actually facilitate social and art mobilization. We can think here of frames of anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, languages of autochtony or being like the first uh, or original inhabitants of a particular area, um, the defense of like sacred forests, uh, ancestral lands and rivers or anti-government and state platforms. And that can help facilitate um, uniting previously not linked actors, uh, which then start organizing themselves um, um, and mobilize, including socially and including uh, uh, armed. Now, the second mechanism um, that we've also seen plenty of examples of today is militarization and state and corporate violence. So, Wherever green extractivist projects are rolled out, there is an uh, increase in the deployment of military uh, and police forces, but also intelligence operations and private security contractors in order to um, secure access to resources and company uh, assets um, or the assets of conservation areas. So occasionally there's, uh, and there's plenty of examples in the extensive literature on corporate state counterinsurgency, social warfare, social pacification, and state and corporate crime, um, that squads, drug cartels, and militias are also being harnessed uh, either by corporations or by corporate allies, such as local elites um, within these struggles. Now, what are the effects of this type of militarization that happens around extractivist zones? Um, it's, in state security forces moving in often tends to rock the boat, especially where uh, these state security forces are uh, ill perceived um, in, uh, in the context of histories of, of colonization and marginalization, uh, where people feel marginalized from the, the central state, and therefore security actors moving in. Um, it's actually reinforcing uh, tensions. Of course, human rights abuses that are commonly committed by security forces in the context of social ecological conflicts um, leads to further grievances. Um, and also that we tend to see forms of growing repression, which make it more attractive to take up arms to protest or to liaise with uh, armed actors in, um, in resisting green extractivist projects. So uh, spirals of violence, repression, and counter-violence, one context in which that has, for instance, happened in, in, the, in relation to traditional um, extractivist projects is, is um, Ogoni land in, um, in Nigeria, where we've seen this with the presence of Shell and other oil companies. Um, so the third mechanism that I wanted to highlight is changing resource endowments. So um, when green extractivist projects move into particular areas, conflict parties can actually gain more financial, human and organizational resources, which affects their capacity to mobilize or to counter mobilize. 
um, and which can therefore facilitate um, the transformation of conflict into violent conflict. For states, that is, uh, this relates often to uh, taxation. They gain increasing revenues by taxing these um, corporations, but also um, these green extractivist projects facilitate forging alliances between corporates and security actors and also the financial institutions that often back uh, these projects. Um, and that leads states to um, dispose of more resources um, and can therefore, uh, these changing power relations can therefore um, set in motion dynamics that lead to the outbreak of violence. For non-state actors, we also observe dynamics of um, rent seeking and extortion of uh, corporations that operate in their areas, um, but how depends immensely on the type of, of, of resource. Um, what we also see with non-state actors is um, they, their ability to forge alliances at multiple scales, also internationally. There's movements of solidarity, for instance, uh, with people that are uh, resisting um, green extractivist projects. And so what we see extensively in the literature on social movements is that uh, um, at different skills, their ability to network at different skills can actually strengthen uh, those movements. And that also means uh, strengthen their capacity to organize, including sometimes um, by, by using violence. Um, a last point is we actually also see non-state armed actors increasingly uh, using renewable energy themselves. One example is rebel held areas in Syria. Um, of course, that doesn't relate to large scale uh, green extractivist projects because these are smaller scale, um, um, these are smaller scale uh, uh, efforts that are like managed uh, in a decentralized manner, but it is interesting because it actually does increase the capacity of non-state uh, violent actors to, to operate. Now, so what? Why is all of this? Why is it interesting or relevant to study links between green extractivist project and violent conflict? Well, um, and we've seen this uh, also throughout the day, uh, for instance, with papers by, um, by Mats Sperbegaard and, and Andy Whitmer. Um, as the energy transition and competition um, for energy uh, resources intensifies, mining and low carbon energy production is moving into new geographical areas. Uh, and I think in a recent panel, uh, Barry Gillis also referred to Rosa Luxemburg's work here um, on the relations between imperialism, um, the expansion of capitalism and violence. But this includes risky areas with ongoing armed conflict, such as we've seen today Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, uh, also occupied indigenous, colonized and otherwise contested territories. Um, there's a further layering with geopolitical tensions, uh, but also the, the increasingly strong effects of climate change um, prompting further socio ecological transformations in many areas. And so this can lead to uh, an intensification of violent conflict, but we have to be very careful here and avoid being deterministic. Uh, just as with climate change, there are no automatic linkages between uh, the expanding green energy frontier um, and violent conflict. Whether those contestations uh, start involved open violence ultimately also depends on the agency of the involved actors. But nevertheless, it is generally anticipated also throughout uh, the corporate world um, that um, green energy projects are increasingly going to be contested and therefore both corporate and governmental actors are actually uh, anticipating and gearing up for this, developing uh, strategies to actually prevent violent contestations from um, emerging or preparing themselves to operate in areas that are risky and subject to armed conflict. So for future lines of research, um, of course, a lot of the literature that I actually drew on focused on the links between violent conflict and um, classical fossil fuel oriented extractivism. So is there 
a difference with green extractivist projects? Uh, this is, uh, at least for me, a question that is too early to, to answer. Also, how do we establish these links um, methodologically? As I said, there are many contestations around uh, calls drawing causal links between social environmental conflict and, and violence. Um, and uh, it, it remains a challenge to actually establish uh, those links. It also remains a challenge to study these dynamics uh, in the context of uh, epistemic violence and the silencing of other knowledges. So we do need to adopt decolonial approaches to this type of research in order to properly uh, um, study these dynamics. Also, how to hold corporate and state actors to account for enacting, instigating, or contributing to violence, whether directly or indirectly, and not only now, but also in the past, as we've seen, historical grievances feed very strongly into social and art mobilization today. And so to grasp this and also address some of these tensions, we do need to look at what happened in the past, actually including in, in the colonial past. And finally, I want to raise the question, how to challenge common distinctions that are made and often problemat problematic distinctions between violent and nonviolent protests. Um, I want to give an example of this. So there's in an increasing literature on so-called environmental defenders. But if we look at mainstream definitions of environmental defenders, for instance, by the United Nations Environment Program, we see that they explicitly refer to nonviolent uh, forms of action. Um, and as I've said, it's incredibly problematic and always contested um, to stick these labels of, of violence versus uh, nonviolence. And that is something that we also have to be aware of. 